It's time now for Morning Rounds. Joining us are CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up this week, the Centers for Disease Control reported a sharp increase in measles here in the U.S. John? Anthony, so far this year, there have been more than 300 cases, the most in 20 years. 97% of the cases began with a traveler bringing measles back to the United States. Dr. Ann Shuket is with the CDC. Most of this is people who have decided not to be vaccinated, exempting from vaccines through personal beliefs or philosophical reasons. And when measles virus is imported into the United States and finds an unimmunized person, that person will get measles. Measles has been reported in 18 states. Almost 90 percent of cases appeared in three places, California, New York and Ohio. Ready? In the United Ready? States, the vaccination rate against measles is over 90 percent. There you go. But pockets of unimmunized people remain. The 177 cases in Ohio were primarily among unvaccinated Amish communities. Some of them traveled to the Philippines, where there's a large measles outbreak. The critical issue is that if you're traveling around the world and you haven't been vaccinated against measles, chances are you're going to get it and bring it back home. John, so if you're traveling this summer, what should you do to prevent getting measles? If you're going abroad, the most effective step is vaccination. Shortest answer ever. Right. Just get it done. Also this week, there was a new report on the growing global threat of obesity. A study in The Lancet shows worldwide obesity rates have increased almost 28 percent among adults and 47 percent among children since 1980. So, Holly, how do they even get this kind of research? How do they make this kind of a report? Right. Well, you know, Vanita, the, the numbers were actually beyond shocking. They were kind of dismal. Um, but they looked at it was a large survey looking at about 200, a little less than 200 countries from the period of 1982 last year. Uh, and and they basically found the biggest take home was that 37 percent of the adult population worldwide is either overweight or obese. Wow. Now, it's particularly dramatic in the states. Even though we're only 5 percent of the world's population, we make up 13 percent of the world's overweight or obese population. But really what the study showed us is that it's not an American problem. It is a worldwide one. Well, were there, were there surprises, Holly, in terms of where obesity is now becoming more prevalent? Right. Well, you know, Anthony, one of the most striking findings, I think, from the from the study was just that even though obesity is increasing everywhere, it's increasing fastest in developing countries. You know, so the thought is that um, as places become more modernized, there's greater access to processed foods, fast foods, people are less physically active, and hence our waistlines are expanding. And once they expand, it's hard to shrink them. But John, is anybody bucking the trend? Is any country decreasing their level of obesity? Not one single country has significantly decreased obesity. Boy, that's discouraging. So given this dismal outlook, as Holly called it, where do we go from here? I think you have to go back to the drawing board and just wipe it clean and start over and realize increasingly we're realizing that you have to change the environment that everybody lives in so that people just trip over healthy behavior. And that has started in schools where the lunches have been improved, but it's no good if you then go home and, and have junk food and don't exercise and, and have unhealthy behavior. So there have been these experiments that I think are very promising. It started in Albert Lee, Minnesota, a small community in Minnesota where they, the whole town got together and they said, let's just make it healthier. So the schools made the lunches better, the restaurants had healthier choices, and the mayor made sure that there were walking paths and bike riding paths, and it was very importantly successful. They had a decrease in obesity, they had a decrease in the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, bill in, in a year by 30, 40 percent. This has now been expanded to the beach communities outside of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I think this is going to ultimately be a very effective way, change the environment. You have to, you're saying we have to have a concerted effort across the board. Basically. Yeah, you can't rely on free will. People make the wrong choices. All right. Memorial Day kicked off the unofficial start to summer this week, and the American Academy of Dermatology launched a new public service campaign to raise skin cancer awareness among men. Take a look. You'd do anything to take care of that spot on your lawn. So why not take care of that spot on your skin? If you're a man over 50, you're in the group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the cancer that kills one person every hour. Check your skin for suspicious or changing spots. Go to spotskincancer.org to find out what to look for. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. The Academy says men over 50 are twice as likely as women to develop skin cancer, but men are less likely to use sunscreen or to get routine skin checks. 
from their doctors. And in a related story, the National Cancer Institute sounded a new warning about indoor tanning. So what's the warning, Holly? You know, it was a very large study, and the, what they found is that our risk for melanoma goes up 59% in everybody who's used a tanning bed. Uh, you know, so this was really impactful. In fact, a lot of people use tanning beds hoping that they'll get a base so they don't get a sunburn. What right. this study showed is whether or not you get a sunburn from the tanning bed or outside, using the tanning bed raises your risk of getting melanoma, which is our deadliest skin cancer. Also this week, the Food and Drug Administration took action on tanning beds, and there's some new regulations. What are they? Well, they're going to, you know, tanning beds are now going to have a black box warning, kind of like what we see on cigarette boxes. Mm. Uh, it's going to say people under the age of 18 really shouldn't use them. And they're also going to put in some regulations where the beds have timers, and there are some limits on the UV um, levels that you can be exposed to. You mentioned under 18. Why is the FDA now so focused on younger people? You know, with tanning beds, the early the you start and the longer you use them, the risk goes up. Uh, you know, so by the end of high school, a third of girls have been in tanning beds and even started to use them regularly. So this isn't about using like draconian methods or scaring people. It's really about protecting kids by being honest about what their risk is and you know really trying to dissuade them from using the machines. All right, finally, researchers in Israel say caring for a baby may actually rewire a dad's brain to be more like a mom's. <laughs> Uh, I don't think my wife would agree with that study. <laughs> but that could be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but John, tell us what's going on. Well, we know in evolution it was primarily the mother who was involved in, in caregiving. And there actually have been studies showing that there's nurturing wiring, neural pathways in the brain that get activated during nurturing. And actually hormones too, like oxytocin, the nurturing mm -hmm. hormone. And the question was, what about guys? I mean, in evolution, we were out hunting. We were looking for mastodons. Do, are we just in neurologically, neurophysiologically incapable of doing the same? thing that that mothers can and it turns out that we have the same pathways and we also can uh, be nurturing not only just in terms of our behavior but in terms of the hormones that are released in terms of the neurological pathways that are activated so right. there's some hope for you and me okay. Anthony. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop looking for now, I just hope you guys find the hormone for multitasking that's what, that's what you guys <laughs> Dr. John LeBouc, Dr. Holly Phillips thank you both